In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Welcome to this simple and solemn service, marking the first Sunday of the season of Lent. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought, in what we have said and done through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ fasted forty days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are, yet without sin, give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your Spirit. And as you know our weakness, so may we know your power to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, beginning at the 8th verse. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the first letter of Peter, chapter 3, beginning at verse 18. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight people, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against Thee. To Thee, Redeemer, on Thy throne of glory, lift we our weeping eyes in holy pleadings. Listen, O Jesus, to our supplications. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have sinned against Chief cornerstone, right hand of the Father, way of salvation, gate of life celestial. Cleanse the sinful souls from all defilement. Hear us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for 
Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Then, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In St Mark's Gospel, everything seems to happen in a hurry. He uses the Greek adverb euthus over 40 times, twice in today's short reading. It means at once, directly or immediately. In the authorised version, it was often translated straightway. This verbal tick certainly drives the story along, giving it real urgency. But the reference to 40 days is likely to slow us down a bit. 40 is a favourite round number in scripture. Moses, for example, stayed 40 days on Mount Sinai. Although the church has computed Lent, its season of penitence, simplicity and learning on the basis of this number, we shouldn't get too fussed about counting the days. And not least, because some commentators have argued that for Mark, Jesus's wilderness period is not exhausted or ended after 40 days and 40 nights, as the hymn is so keen to remind us. In fact, for Jesus, these 40 days sound the dominant note of his entire ministry. It is going to be a confrontation indeed, a battle. A battle against the forces of evil. In this time of testing, temptation and trial, Jesus confronts the horror, the loneliness and the danger with which the wilderness is fraught while being sustained and nourished and strengthened by the ministers of God. This is the period that forges his character, his spirit, in the furnace of the red-hot desert. If we are to permit ourselves to sit light to the Lenten arithmetic, we might also want to see beyond the mythological language in this text about Satan and God's angels. I call these references mythological not in the sense that what they refer to is not real or true, but rather because the supernatural characters of this drama 
are symbolic of greater, deeper truths, beyond the everyday truths. Satan is, after all, the personification of evil, and evil is certainly real. And while angels are just messengers, they are messengers that create a link across the deep gulf that lies between God and ourselves. And they therefore symbolise the word and touch that we hope may come from contact with the divine. Like the dove and voice at Jesus' baptism and his vision of the heavens torn apart, this is all picture language, something to draw in Sunday school jotters or paint on canvases and the walls of churches imagery that stands for and points to truths and powers that are beyond pictures, beyond words even, and beyond our everyday experiences. Unlike them, however, the wilderness is physically, mundanely, literally real. We can feel it and touch it, and if we are not careful, we may die in it. In Mark's galloping gospel, in which Jesus' temptations come hard on the heels of his baptism, Jesus receives God's breath, God's spirit, and it immediately blows him away, drives him out, forces him into the hot, bare, lifeless, stony wasteland of the desert. I visited the Judean desert once in the back of an elderly Bethlehem taxi whose passenger doors, I noted with some anxiety, could only be opened from the outside. The place was certainly hot and dry and dead. Apart from us, it was naturally deserted, for that is what a desert is, a deserted place. Even in the company of others, it was easy to feel the aloneness of the place. Decanting from our decrepit transport, we stared around us in silence. Holier and braver people had deliberately chosen such locations walking freely into the desert to deal with our own demons and to be tempered and honed so as to become spiritually tougher and sharper and to draw clo closer to God. But Jesus had to be driven to such a place for he knew better than anyone and would come to know even more clearly as his ministry progressed how dangerous these deserts are. These places where the wild beasts have at last to be confronted and tamed. And where, in human terms anyway, we have to face them alone. As the late great Harry Williams once put it, the wilderness belongs to us, but for most people it is inside them, not outside, an absence of contact, a sense of being alone. 
Now, human beings are social animals, so, though some are more sociable than others. We were created and evolved to belong together. It is not good that the man should be alone, the scripture insists early on. Alone we can be helpless and are often hopeless. But sometimes being alone is inevitable. There are some events in life we can only engage in on our own, for ourselves, by which I really mean that only we can do them, and mostly no one can do them for us. These are moments when we are truly alone, even though we may be surrounded by others, hopefully by those who love and want us. But even they cannot take over these tasks. There's one example of this that hardly anyone can remember. We are born alone. Even if there was a twin to compete with, we came into this world on our own. And no one will be able to do our dying for us either. They may very much wish that they could, but they can't. At our end, as at our beginning, we shall be once more on our own. And in between these two great solitary life events, there are likely to be many times, many other occasions, indeed seasons, when we shall find ourselves alone once again. Alone with a key decision or an action, a commitment or confrontation, even a battle perhaps. It is at such time that we may feel so very alone. But what Jesus is and does, he is and does for us, including this. When Jesus began to teach and heal other people, he did it for their sakes. When he came eventually in his life of self-giving to suffer and to die, he did that for others also, for all our sakes. And so too now, Jesus goes into the desert this harsher and more physical symbol of our own lonesomeness in order to face, to meet and to oppose evil, humankind's greatest adversary and wildest of beasts, and to do it for us. During Lent, we are asked to follow Jesus into the wilderness in order to learn from him, to learn what he learned there. And what he learned above all, I believe, was strength, including the strength of faith. On his own, in a barren landscape, Without the comfort of shelter, friends, family or even food. And beset with the temptation to seek an easier life and a less rocky way. He learnt to rely on God. He had to look beyond all the props and supports of this passing world. And to sense what lies beyond it sustaining it all in love. 
to see below and beneath his solitary suffering and a lonely, empty and hostile world, the everlasting arms of God. And to trust in their strength and their constancy. To trust that when all else fails and all other comforts flee, we shall still be securely held. The strength that Jesus learnt in the desert was not learnt as a piece of theology, a learning about God. It was a learning by experience, a form of perception, a learning by seeing and feeling, by embracing and becoming. In this way, Jesus learnt to take on something of the strength of God's character, God's steadfastness, resilience and reliability. And the strength of God's unceasing love, which exceeds all other loving. Here Jesus learnt the strength that he needed for his life and ministry from the strong God who undergirds all life, who holds it in being and who never lets go. This learning was to continue. It had to for Jesus, as it must do for us. And if Jesus' life offers any clue to when and where this further learning will come, I think it is that it will be in those wilderness experiences when we feel most alone, most deserted. For this sort of learning can only happen in the dry days of doubt and on the rough terrain of our uphill paths. Because there are some kinds of strength that can only be given to us when we really need them. And there are some visions that we can only see clearly when our world is at its darkest, when we are utterly alone and weak and powerless and wholly surrounded by the wild beasts. It is in just such Lenten days that stripped naked of all pretense and all protection, we must kneel before God on our own. And there at last we may trust, receive God's grace. And then Then, maybe, in Harry Williams's arresting words, Lent, we discover, is Easter in disguise. And then, too, in St Mark's more vivid imagery, perhaps we shall also find ourselves waited on by the angels of the Most High God. Let it be so. Amen.
Let us declare our faith in God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now Tony is going to lead us in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Everlasting God, help us to use this time of Lent to develop our discipleship and discipline. Your son Jesus Christ was tried and tempted by the devil. May we never be ashamed of temptation, but saved from the weakness of giving in. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for the whole family of your church here and throughout the world. We pray for bishops Paul and Sarah, for Father Barnaby, our rector, and for Father Jeff, our worship leader today. May all your people at St. Margaret's, St. John's and St. Edmund's be built up in faith and demonstrate in their lives the gospel of Jesus Christ. Especially as at this time we are struggling meet to meet together due to the pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for those in positions of authority and leadership, that they do not misuse their powers, but respect and care for all their people and for the natural resources of their countries. During our Lenten fasting, may we be constantly aware of those in our world who are always hungry and thirsty, and of all those who have so little when we have so much. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we ask you to protect our loved ones, our friends and our neighbours. We pray that this Lenten season may bring grace to those who no longer practice their faith and that they may return in the certain knowledge of your acceptance of them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for those who are ill, and in pain, 
for those who are sad and hurt, for those in hospital and for those convalescing. We especially pray for any suffering from coronavirus. Today, we name the following for whom our prayers have been requested. Anne Stafford, Charlie Kilgore, Diane Moby-Pape, Elizabeth Harper, Diana Holmes, Alan Wade, Aled Hawkins, Peter Asp Appleby, Christine Mole, Father Ian Hoskins, Jan Whitehead, Diane Bartell, and also Christine Livesey's grandson, James. And we pray too for any others who may be on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we commit to your gracious care all those recently departed this life. We especially pray for Pamela Lucas, priest, for Margaret Rankin and Dorothy Snowden. And we pray too for those whose anniversary of death occurs at around this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now in a short period of quiet, let us bring before God any special intentions of our own. Almighty God, in the week ahead, help us to keep the faith deeply and passionately so that we may become beacons of hope to those around us. And now rejoicing with Mary, the Blessed Mother of our Lord, with Aidan, Bede, Cuthbert, Edmund, Godric, John, Margaret and all the saints, we commend ourselves and all God's people to his unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you.
the words of the final responsory are based on the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son. He is the sacrifice for our sins, that we might live through him. If God loves us so much, we ought to love one another. If we love one another, God lives in us. And now may Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.